Uh, video, okay, looks good. Right, so we finished last time talking about the dot product. And that was a way of taking two vectors and combining them to get a third vector or to get a to get a, a number out, a scalar, right? So it's also known as the scalar product. Today, we're going to introduce one more way of, of combining two, uh, two vectors. This one's called the vector product or the cross product. Um, and the reason why there's uh, the reason why there's just two is an interesting story of itself. It's kind of complicated, but uh, remember that there are two ways, two distinct, unique ways to to multiply vectors together. Whereas with numbers, there's only just the one. You just multiply them. So um, without further ado, let's continue on to the vector product. So. Like I said, this is the second way that you can uh, multiply two vectors together. The first way was the scalar product, and that takes two vectors and uh, two vectors combines them into a scalar. The vector product, as you may have figured out from the name, takes two vectors and combines them to produce a third vector. So uh, this this product involves the perpendicular part. perpendicular parts of two vectors. Now remember, for the dot product, it involved the parallel parts. You had one vector, and then you asked how much the other vector, uh, you asked how much the other vector pointed in the same direction, right? And so in that case, the scalar product involved the, the parallel components, parallel parts of two vectors. The vector product involves the perpendicular parts of two vectors. So if you have one vector A, you have another vector b, whereas for the scalar product, we cared about this distance here. For the, for the vector product, we care about this distance. And so this distance, we can just figure out using uh, trigonometry. If that angle is theta, this distance is just a times sine theta, right? And so what we want to do is we want to figure out a way to multiply the perpendicular distance a times sine theta by the length of b. Now there's some trouble here because in three dimensions, in three dimensions, you could have a vector that points here, that is directly over the x-axis, say. And you can have another vector. Um, actually, let me draw it a different way. Let's say you have one vector that points along the x-axis, and you have another vector that points, say, uh, how do we want to draw this? Well, yeah, yeah. Another vector that, say, points along the z-axis, right? So the thing is, is we want, when we take the product of two different things, we want their answer to be somewhat unique, i.e., if you take the, the cross product of a vector along the z-axis with the, with the x-axis, then you should get a different answer than if you did the same thing for the y-axis and the x-axis, right? You should get different answers because they're kind of oriented differently. And the trouble is, is if we only just multiplied these two quantities, the perpendicular, the perpendicular length and times the magnitude of the other, then there'd be no way to distinguish between the green and the orange vectors. They have the same, they're, they're both perpendicular to the x-axis. So we wouldn't be able to differentiate between the two. So that's why we need to treat treat the end result as a vector, because not only will it include the length, which would be the same for both the green and the orange vectors, but it would also include a direction, which would be different for the green and the orange vectors. Um, <clears throat> so let's first talk about the magnitude of the vector that gets spat out. So as I said, we want to involve the product of the magnitude of one vector and the perpendicular magnitude of the other. So one can compute that magnitude as the area of a parallelogram. By the way, the magnitude really just is the product of the magnitude of A and the magnitude of B. But there's another way to produce it, which is this parallelogram rule. And this is a nice way to visualize the, uh, the magnitude of the cross product. So if you have a vector A and you want to find the magnitude of the vector product, you do like you would with addition. You stick vector B the tail of vector b on the head of vector a. And then you just ask, what is the area of this parallelogram? So the area of that parallelogram 
is the magnitude of A cross B. And we use the standard X symbol for the cross product. So the magnitude of A cross B, which is how we would say it, is, well, you can work out the geometry yourself. It is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them, where here this angle is theta. So, so it really does just match up. These two things, uh, these two things are the same. If you just multiply the perpendicular distance with the magnitude of the other, sorry, the perpendicular, the perpendicular component of one vector by the magnitude of the other vector, you get the same thing as if you had just found the area of the parallelogram formed by those two vectors. Um, so just just to formalize this, so you can see it written down, the notation that we use for this vector product, we would write a, and then we use a cross symbol or an X cross B. We call this the cross product. And remember, this produces, this spits out a vector. That's why we asked the question, what's the magnitude? Now, because it spits out a vector, it has a magnitude and a direction. And so we've established what the magnitude is. Now we need to figure out what is the direction of this cross product? So the um, direction- Sam, I have a quick question. Yeah, fire away. So um, how do you know whether to do it like you did in that example you just did? So like tail to head or to connect the vectors like the first very first one you did where it's just tail to tail? So so this was just a geometric picture that I was trying to convey. If you, if oh, you OK, like if, if you do it this way, you could you could just as well do it that way. And then the parallelogram would be formed like this. Oh, I see. Right. So, so they, 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 are the, they are the same thing. And in fact, they're geometrically equivalent because the area of a parallelogram is the height times the length, right? Okay. It, it is just this distance times this distance. Okay, thank you so, so much. So it agrees, no problem. Right, so let's figure out the direction. So the direction also uses this notion of the uh, parallelogram. And the way that we figure out the direction is you put, so, so if you wanted to find the direction of A cross B, geometrically, you would lay down A, you would put the tail of B on the head of A, just like in the parallelogram picture. And then you would complete your parallelogram, right? But you would let it circulate. You would draw it in a way that circulates. So you would draw it that way. So see how there, there's kind of like a swirling, like it goes around the parallelogram. So the circulation direction matters here because if A was pointing in a different direction, the direction that it circulates in clockwise, counterclockwise, in this case, it's, it's circulating about an axis that is, um, I, don't, I don't know if you can see this, but it's about, it's about an axis that curls this way, right? Does it look like, does my hand look like it's curling in the right direction to you or the wrong direction? Because uh, I, I'm just asking because my, my video I think is mirrored. So like- I think it's the opposite way. I okay, think so it, just, yeah. it looks like, okay. So, so this is the direction that it looks like it's going in. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so, so from our, from, from like, if, if our, if it circulates this way, then there is a unique direction, a unique vector direction associated with that circulation, right? Because if you choose your right hand, if you always consistently choose your right hand and then you curl your hand in a direction, your thumb is always going to point in a particular direction, right? And if it instead circulated this way, your thumb would point in a different direction. And if instead it circulated this way, your thumb would point in a third direction. And if it circulated this way, it would point in a fourth direction and so on. So we can associate the direction of this circulation with the with a vector, with a single direction, with a with a, like with an arrow effectively. Um sorry, can you please explain again the circulation? Yeah, so, so the idea is you just stick A and you, you just lay down A, put the tail of B on the head of A, and then you just complete your parallelogram and let it circulate in the direction of the original vectors. So on the left side, it would go, it would follow the direction of A, on the top, it would follow the direction of B, and then you would let it continue. So then it forms a loop. That's all. Um, but right, and, so- um, does, it, does it have to be um, put B the uh, the head of B on the yes, tail of yes. A or here, the order matters and where you place them matters. Yeah. Okay, so so this is a convention that we're choosing. Um, right. So, so this, this way of associating a direction with a circulation or, or a, like a vector direction, just a single like pointed direction with, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise in some plane, 
That way of associating a direction to a circulation is given by the right-hand rule. So the right-hand rule is basically, it's, a, it's again, it's just a convention that everybody agrees upon, but it's the idea that you curl your fingers of your right hand in the direction of circulation and then your thumb points in the direction of the associated vector or of the resulting vector, I should say. So in this case, because A points up and to the right, and by the way, you can, uh, so wait, did we agree that, that this way? Yeah, this way is correct. So since A points this way, B points this way, see how, see the direction my fingers are going, the circulation has to go that way. So one way to see this is stick your hand in the direction of the first vector, curl your fingers so they point in the direction of the second vector, and you have to use your right hand, by the way, that's super important. You have to use your right hand. If you use your left hand, you'll get the, the wrong answer. Then your thumb points in the direction of the vector that, that results from A cross B. So in this case, it points into the screen or into the paper, right? And so because everybody has agreed on that convention, that is, that is the way that we associate direction with cross or with a, that is the way that is the way we determine the direction of cross products. Now, this was come up, people came up with this 150 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe. If everybody had decided to use their left hand, that would be what we would be teaching today. But there's, and there, there's no distinction between the two. You just have to consist, you just have to be consistent and everybody has to agree on the same system. It's almost like a system of units. It's not quite, but it's almost like a system of units. As long as everybody agrees, it doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. Um, <clears throat> so, right. So let's talk about the properties of this cross product. So by the way, we've, com we've completely characterized it by now. We know what the magnitude is. We know what the direction is. That's the entirety of the vector that you get. You take two vectors in, you get one vector out. It has a magnitude given by this thing and it has a direction given by this right-hand rule. Um, <clears throat> right, so let's talk about the properties. Uh, by the way, torque very much has to do with uh, the cross product. So, so uh, Jack is quite right. So first, we're gonna kind of follow the same train that we did for the dot product. What is the magnitude of A cross itself? Oh, that's a terrible A. Well, we can use the we can use the formula that we use for magnitude. It's just the product of the two vectors times the sine of the angle between them. So this is just A squared. Remember, A squared means the magnitude of A squared, or it just means A dot itself, times the sine of the angle between them. Now, the angle between them is 0. So in this case, it's just times sine of 0. Now, sine of 0 is 0. So the cross product between two vectors or between a vector and itself is always zero. It has magnitude zero. All right, what about i hat cross j hat? Well, this one you'll have to visualize. It's a little bit hard to uh, show, but imagine, actually, no, I probably can draw it. So you have i hat points this way. Here we have x, y, and z. We have j hat in green. And we have k hat in orange. So you'll have to bear with me on this. It's going to be hard to make it work. So stick my hand in the direction of i hat. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, there. Hand in direction of i hat. Now I want my hand to curl so that it points uh, wrong way. Uh, so hand in the direction of i hat. Fingers curl into the direction of j hat, right? Thumb points in the direction of the resulting vector. That's in the k hat direction. And it turns out that that's precisely right. i hat and j hat are defined so that their cross product is k hat. Or rather, k hat's defined so that it is the cross product of i hat and j hat. You could do the same thing with j hat cross k hat, and you would get i hat. And you could do the same thing with k hat cross i hat, and you would get j hat. Um, second statement, super important. a cross b is not equal to b cross a. In fact, it's equal to negative b cross a. So here, it just to outline it, the, uh, the nature of what's happening, the order that you take the cross product matters. It's not how you spell matters. It's super important. You'll get the negative if you do it in the wrong order. And so in particular, j hat cross i hat, 
is equal to negative k hat. We knew we know that i hat cross j hat is k hat, but j hat cross i hat negative k hat. And then the third property, which is or the fourth property, which is as you might have expected, it distributes over addition just like the dot product. Right. So this whole right hand rule corresponds with the, the choice of coordinates that we use. So we use we use this thing called or we use these things called right handed coordinates. And that means that your third direction that you choose, like you didn't have to choose X and Y, you had you just have to choose some perpendicular coordinates. The third the direction of the third one is kind of chosen for you by the right hand rule. It's chosen by the fact that your first vector cross your second vector has to be given or the cross product of your first and second um, like axis vectors is defined to point in the direction of your third axis vector. And it's defined by the right-hand rule. That direction is defined by the right-hand rule. So for example, if, if you choose some axes, like if, if I had written that z points downwards, then I would not be using a right-handed coordinate system. I'd be using a left-handed coordinate system. And so everybody has to agree which coordinate system we use. Yeah, the cross product and the vector product, they mean the same thing. They're just two different names of the same thing. So now let's just do a quick sample computation. What is a cross b? Um, where we're just going to use standard coordinates or standard components. So this is a x i hat plus a y j hat cross b x i hat plus b y j hat. And you could have done this in three dimensions using these properties, but I'm not going to because it's a pain and it'll, it would take forever. So writing this out, we get, again, it distributes over additions. We get a x b x i hat cross i hat. Now we have to be careful about order. So if we're going to do first outer inner last, we have to maintain the order that they multiply in. So first is fine because it's i cross i. Second or outer would be i cross j. So we have plus a x b y i hat cross j hat. Inner is j cross i. So we have a y b x j hat cross i hat plus a y b y j hat cross j hat. So that and, and I'm I'm being very careful with order here. Note that I wrote i hat or i hat cross j hat here and j hat cross i hat there. That that matters. So now we would just go and we would look at our uh, properties and see what we can do. Any vector cross itself is zero. So automatically these terms go away because it's i hat cross itself and j hat cross itself. Now we know that i hat cross j hat that's k hat. Right? We already know that. So we could replace that there and j hat cross i hat well, it's the reverse of i hat cross j hat, so it should be negative k hat. So this is negative k hat here. So our final result looks like a x b y minus a y b x in the k hat direction. And so that's our cross product. Now, in general, if we had had three dimensions, if if both of our vectors had components in the z direction, then we would have had a, a resulting vector that has an i hat, a j hat, and a k hat component. Uh, it's it's only because we're only we only considered vectors that lie in two dimensions that we that we got a resulting vector out that just points in the k hat direction. That's not a general phenomenon. It's just because I wanted to do a simpler calculation. Now I'm going to leave vector products there. Uh, I do promise that these will be use, useful in the later. Um, does our final answer need to distribute like you you should simplify however much you normally would in a math class, right? Always you know write your answer as simple as you can. Um, this vector product will be useful, but it's kind of hard to give a good example of one um, without, without you having seen the physics to do it. So I'm not going to give any examples now, but you, they will come up later in the course. Uh, there is a, like a practice example with real numbers that I linked to in the lecture notes, so do check those out after lecture. Uh, they're in the Rice University textbook, so take a look at those. Um, I would I would stray from using the determinant because uh, unless you understand why the determinant works, it's you know you're kind of losing understanding. And this way you get more comfortable with the components because you know the determinant method only works if you're using standard Cartesian coordinates, which we, which we will not always be using. Right, um, so let's move on to straight line motion. Oh, we're already 20 minutes in, we're not gonna finish on time. We're not gonna finish everything I want to finish rather. Right, so like I mentioned on the first day of, le of lecture on Monday, motion is kind of 
super fundamental to understanding physics. So we ought to be able to, you know, if we're, if we're going to do a physics class, we ought to talk about motion. So let's talk about the easiest case, which is just motion in one direction only. So think like a train on a track. It only moves forward and backward. It doesn't move left. It doesn't move right. It'd be super simple that way. So let's talk about what motion is. So motion, and you guys probably already know this, this is just change in position over a duration. This is just to say there is no motion if something's position is not changing with time, right? So last time we talked about vectors and the time before we talked about vectors too. And so vectors can be useful to describe uh, to describe quantities that have more than one direction. Like for example, if you want to talk about, um, I don't know, uh, a, a velocity, you would just give a speed, five meters per second, and a direction. However, in straight line motion, there's only one direction at all. So you actually don't need to worry about vectors. So we can actually, in, instead of working with vectors, and by the way, you could work with vectors all you wanted to, you would just only have an I hat and it would just be carried around everywhere. Instead of working with vectors, here, we vectors just become positive and negative numbers. So in one in, in one dimensional motion, motion in a straight line, instead of having to just, instead of writing that your velocity is five meters per second in the I hat direction, or negative two meters per second in the I hat in the I hat direction, you would just say your velocity is five meters per second, your velocity is negative two meters per second. And that carries the same amount of information because there's only one direction. So your vector is either pointing to the left or pointing to the right, basically. And you can characterize that by just using positive and negative numbers. So <clears throat> when we talk about position, we want to be able to treat this mathematically. So in this case, typically, the position would be described by a vector. You would say, like, for example, um, I am at, I, I'm at some latitude. That would be, say, one axis. I'm at some longitude. That would be another axis. And then I'm at some height above the Earth's surface. So that's three numbers. You can put three numbers together into three components, and you can get a vector. In one dimension, like if you were just, if your whole universe was a train track, you could just say, I'm five meters from, I'm five meters to the right, or I'm 19 meters to the left. So you only need one number to describe motion in a straight line. And so the thing is, is we, numbers are great, but if we want to be able to predict the future, we want to be able to describe, yeah, you, we will need a reference point, but that's not, that's not like a coordinate. That's, that's like a, a, a that's, that's a pre, pre arranged position. Numbers are great, but if we want to be able to predict the future, we should be able to describe a position at any instant in time. And the way we would do that it was, is we would just write a function of time, in this case, x, as a function of time. So position x along the x-axis, say, and you get a value at each different moment in time. And so we call this the coordinate position because it is the position of a coordinate, right? The x-coordinate. And, and what your x-coordinate is might change in time. <clears throat> right, so let's talk about displacement. So displacement is kind of the first well-defined thing that doesn't rely on some reference point. So displacement is really just the change in position x of t. That's all displacement is. It tells you how much your position has changed. And that doesn't depend on what, what like where your reference point is. It's If I say I moved five meters to the right, that doesn't depend on if I called myself initially at point zero, or if my final place is at point zero, it's still five meters to the right. So the way that we describe this mathematically is we would write that displacement is equal to the way we write is we write delta x. And this means x final minus x initial, which secretly means the x position at some final time minus the x position at some initial time. So this delta here, you're going to see it a lot in this course. And it generally means final minus initial. Does, an, it, does displacement care about direction or just that it cares about direction? Right. So it's liter so, so x can be positive or negative, right? So if I had done, uh, if so five meters to the right might be positive 
But if I move five meters to the left, it might be negative. And once we start talking about motion in multiple dimensions, two dimensions or higher, displacement becomes a vector. So basically everything that we're gonna talk about in straight line motion will become a vector when we move to two dimensions or three dimensions. It's just, you don't need vectors to talk about them in one dimension. So actually that, that kind of uh, segues well into the important point that I would like to make. So if the final position is smaller, I should say, um, is more negative, smaller could be smaller in magnitude, like two is smaller than five, but also negative three is small or negative three is smaller than two. So if the final position is smaller, is more negative than the initial position, xi, then the displacement is negative. And that just means that your thing moved to the left or whatever you've decided your positive direction is. Now remember, when I say to the left, that's just because I'm assuming some convention of the, the direction to the right is positive. But you didn't have to choose that. You could have chosen that the direction to the left is positive, and that would be an equally good choice. You just have to make clear what your convention is before you start a problem. Right, so <clears throat> there's a good example that I laid out in the lecture notes, and I'll just pre briefly talk about it. So say a person walks forward 14 meters, then they walk backward five meters, then they walk forward three meters and then backwards 20 meters. You could ask, what is the total displacement? And that would basically be a measure of how far and in what direction is the person at the end relative to the person at the beginning. And if you had followed along, if you had recorded it or written it down, you would find that the displacement is negative eight meters where positive is forward and negative is backward. So the person is eight meters behind where they started. Now, again, I linked to another uh, example that does mo more of this sort of explicit displacement type calculations in the lecture notes. So very much do click on those. Um, now, just as a word of caution, displacement and distance covered are not the same thing because the person that was walking forward 14 meters, back five meters, forward three meters, back 20 meters, covered a lot more distance than eight meters, right? They walked a very far distance. But displacement just cares about where you end up and where you started. It doesn't care about how, like how much you actually traveled in the meantime. What does care, uh, well, actually, okay. So that notion of total distance covered can be calculated in a different way and we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time about it because it's not super useful most of the time. So let's talk about another concept. This is average velocity. So like I said before, velocity is a vector. So in this case, um, because all of the vectors just become positive and negative numbers, in this case, the velocity is also just a positive and negative number. So let's ask the question, how do we describe how fast motion is? Well, the answer is we use velocity. And the way we compute it is relatively straightforward. The average velocity of some system over some amount of time is just defined to be, we, we call it V sub AVE. And it's just defined to be the total change in X, this is the displacement, divided by the duration, delta T. So delta T just tells us is just how long that displacement took. Written another way, this is XF minus XI divided by TF minus TI. So um, the reason why we can do this in general, so, so remember up until now, because we're doing one dimensional motion, these are just numbers. So you can multiply and divide numbers how, by however much you want. But once we get to two dimensions, you might think, well, wait a minute, if, if displacement's a vector, how can we divide it by a time? Well, remember that um, you can always multiply and divide vectors by numbers, by scalars. And the difference, the change in time, delta t, that's just a number. It's literally just a number. It, well, it's a number of seconds anyway. So this is just allowed. And so it, so even though it doesn't look like it right now, the average velocity is a vector. Keep that in mind. It's super important. And you know, it's probably like I've taught this class a bunch, and it's probably the biggest mistake is that people forget that various quantities are vectors. So this is the first quantity that you should remember. And really, I should write that uh, delta x is a vector too. Also super important. The only reason why we're not using the vector symbols here is because it becomes redundant in one dimension. But once we get to two dimensions, it will be more complicated. Now, 
uh, I linked to another example, but I want to walk, I want to work through, actually, how are we on time? No, we are not good on time. Um, I listed another example that uh, I would like to go over, but I don't have a whole lot of time for it. So basically, it's just an example of what the average velocity is if you don't actually move. Let's say you go forward five meters and then backwards five meters over the course of 10 seconds. Your average velocity is zero because even though you did cover a distance, the average velocity is defined as displacement divided by duration. And so because you ended up back where you started, your displacement is zero. Hence, your average velocity is zero. It's not the, the averages of all of this velocities that you had. Now, there's another type of velocity that we will use a lot more often, instantaneous velocity. Right, so this, so whereas average velocity just tells us how the, uh, basically the rate at which an object moved on average, instantaneous velocity tells us the velocity that happens during motion, which you might, agree with me is more useful. And so this tells us how fast something is moving at a single moment in time. And so to do that, we just use calculus. We use calculus to figure that out. We just take the limit where delta t goes to 0. So we just find the average velocity for smaller and smaller durations. And you'll and it, it should make sense then that if as long as your as long as your speed isn't changing too too quickly or your velocity isn't changing too quickly once you make the duration small enough that you're computing the average velocity for it won't it 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 won't it won't change anymore and so the way we define instantaneous velocity is exactly as you might expect from a calculus class so we just use the letter v for instantaneous velocity and again later it will have a vector symbol over it to indicate it's a vector and this is just the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t. But this really just is the derivative of x with respect to t. That's all it is. Uh, just as a note here, delta x in the above equation is really x of ti plus delta t. That's where the, uh, or, sorry, uh, minus x of ti. That's why it becomes a derivative. And again, more examples like the, if you're going to if you're only going to look at examples for one lecture, this is the lecture to do it because there's a lot you guys need to get a lot of practice with this because this stuff is bread and butter. We're going to be using this for the remainder of the quarter. So make sure you get the practice that you need. So again, I linked two more things in the lecture notes. So again, click on those. Um, right. Next concept. And I know we're just blazing through these, but they're all kind of very closely related. And at least up until now, they're relatively intuitive. The next idea is average and instantaneous acceleration. So you guys all know what acceleration is, at least intuitively. Um, the notion that you have of acceleration isn't quite right, at least not from a physics perspective, but we'll, we'll fix that. So what acceleration measures is it measures change, change in velocity. So that is, it captures the notion of speeding up or slowing down. And indeed, once we get to multiple dimensions, it also captures the notion of turning. Because your, if your velocity, which is a vector, is changing directions, that means that, it's, that, that the change in velocity is not 0, right? So the average acceleration, a sub a v e, this is just delta v. And remember, v means instantaneous. It's not, this is not delta of the average velocity. It's delta v over delta t which is just vf minus vi over tf minus ti. So nothing surprising there. It's just your final velocity minus your initial velocity. And again, these are vectors, but we know how to add and subtract vectors. We know how to multiply and divide vectors by numbers. And the instantaneous acceleration, which we just call a, is just the limit as delta t goes to 0 of delta v over delta t or using our calculus knowledge, it's just the time derivative of the velocity, which is, again, a thing that you can do to vectors. You can, you can take derivatives of vectors. And because the velocity is the time derivative of position, this is just two time derivatives of position. So just as a word of caution, the word acceleration, as we use it in physics, means any change in velocity. 
it does not just mean speeding up. I will very much try to avoid using the word decelerate or decelerating because that's still acceleration. It's just acceleration in a different direction. Keep in mind that if, if you're traveling to the right, say if you're traveling to the right at some speed, so that's a, ve that's a vector and, or that's a direction and a magnitude, and then your speed increases, the difference between your final speed and your, and your initial speed is also positive. It also points to the right. So that would have, be an acceleration to the right. If on the other hand, you're moving to the right, but you started slowing down, that means that your final velocity is smaller than your initial velocity. And so your acceleration would be pointing to the left. So in that case, it's still acceleration. It's just pointing in the other direction. Yes, right now we're just covering these concepts for straight line motion. And also, as I mentioned before, if you do ask a question like via text, make sure that you ask it so everybody can see it, unless it's like obviously personal so that people know what question I'm answering. Right, and so again, for, for acceleration, there's even more examples linked in the Libra text and in the Rice University textbook. So take a look, you'll need, the, you'll need the examples. All right, so in the next 14 minutes, God, we have so much to cover. Um, we're definitely not going to get through it all, but we'll do our best. So once now that we have this, this notion of acceleration, velocity, and displacement, position, all of those things just understood. And by the way, all of these are understood to be functions of time, right? Because how can you take a derivative of something if it's not changing with time? So I will often just drop the, you know, the sub the like the function part, but just assume it's a function of time. Now that we do that, we can fit these concepts together. We can relate the notion, we, we can use notions about uh, initial velocities and initial uh, and accelerations and things like that to relate positions to other positions at different moments in time. And to do so requires equations of motion. Equations of motion. So equations of motion is just the way of fitting or, or the way of taking some initial data or rather you use equation of motions to take some information that you know and extrapolate, predict things that will happen to your system at other times. And so the equations of motion that we're going to use, we're going to use something specifically called kinematics, which are the simplest equations of motion, but hey, it's the first course in physics. We're not jumping straight into the standard model, right? And just as a, as a, as just to be very clear, we're not at all talking about the causes of these motion, right? We're not we're not going to characterize how hard a thing has to be pushed to do a certain thing. We're just talking about what happens once something is happening to that object, right? So usually, um, at least for the first part of this course, usually we will deal with constant acceleration, i.e. the acceleration, while in principle it could be a function of time. Your acceleration could change at different points in time. You know, you take, put your foot on the brake, you take your put it, you put your foot on the gas. It changes your acceleration at time at different times. It's easiest to just handle the case where the acceleration is constant at first. So let's just handle that first, and we can deal with non-constant acceleration later. So the way we do that is we would write well, the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity, and because this is constant, that means that the time derivative of the velocity is constant. So the question then is, with this fact, how do we find the velocity as a function of time? So the, the acceleration isn't changing at different times, but the velocity surely is. As, as long as the acceleration is not zero, of course the velocity will change. So what we're going to do is we're going to do what we always do in math, and we're going to do the same thing to both sides. So we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to integrate both sides with respect to some new variable, call it dt prime. And we're going to do the same things to both sides of that equation. So I'm just going to integrate from 0 to the variable t the both sides of the equation with respect to dt prime. So that so you can always do the same thing to both sides. So it's just it's just an integral from 0 to t of dv dt dt prime. Now, just to be clear, um, really, I, really, I, I should write this as just because we'll get caught up in notation. This is this is like v prime, right? So this is this is like v prime of t, 
Now it's V prime of, I really didn't want to get caught up in this. Um, you'll just have to believe me that this is dV dt prime, where V is now a function of T prime. We're allowing V to vary. We're, we're, uh, we're using this equation true at any moment in time. And in particular, it's true when T is equal to T prime. Anyway, so far so good. This is just the thing that we're allowed to do. And then we can just use the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is the integral of a derivative. And we know how to evaluate t prime. It's just some separate variable. It's just because we don't want to use the same variable here and here. That's all. It's just a dummy variable. You guys have seen this in calculus. Um, <clears throat> this is a constant. So we know how to do that integral. That's just, <clears throat> sorry. This integral on the left-hand side is just at minus 0, right? On the, on the right-hand side, it's the integral of a derivative. So this is v of t minus v of 0. It's the integral of a derivative. So you just plug in the top, and then you subtract the bottom, right? You guys have all seen this before. So rewriting this, we're just going to define. This is just a convention that we use. We define the symbol v with a little subscript 0. That means v of 0. That's all it means. So then our equation becomes v of t is equal to v naught plus a t. And that's our first kinematic equation. It tells us how the velocity changes with time when the acceleration is constant. Now, what about position? Well, we can do the same thing. We know that v is the time derivative of x. And so we can, we can integrate, again, 0 to t of v of t prime dt prime equals 0 to t dx dt prime dt prime. You should be familiar with this. This isn't particularly hard calculus, but um, this is just how how these formulas. Like, if I just gave you the equations, of the, the kinematic equations, I would be doing you a disservice because they're not hard to derive, and it's useful to understand why they are the way they are. <clears throat> so now we know what v of t prime is. This is just an integral from zero to t of v naught minus a t prime dt prime. And again, we use the fundamental theorem of calculus here. It's just the integral of a derivative. So this is just x of t minus x naught. And again, x naught means x at time t equals 0. So now, again, v naught is just a number. A is just, it's, they're just numbers. They're just constants. So we can integrate this thing. And so what we're left with is we get v naught t minus 1 half a t squared on the left-hand side. And then you have minus 0 Sorry, this should be a plus here. Um, that should be a plus there. <clears throat> Equals x of t minus x naught. And so we can rearrange that to get x of t equals x naught plus v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. And you've probably seen this equation in high school. This is the position kinematic equation. <clears throat> now, um, these go together. Those are kind of the fundamental um, fundamental kinematic equations. And these are true for constant acceleration only. So if the acceleration is not constant, these equations are just false. Um, <clears throat> now, you can rearrange these a lot, actually. And there's a description that's in the Libre text that I won't go a whole lot into. But the basic gist is that once you understand what types of variables can or what types of quantities can show up in these equations, like time is the independent variable, for example. The, the variables x and x of t and y of t, those are dependent variables. And then they're just some constants, x naught, v naught, and a. Those are all just constants that you either calculate or you know beforehand. Once you know those, once you know what types of quantities show up, you can rearrange them to get other equations. And that's just like using, like rearrange them using algebra tricks. So for example, um, you could get, <clears throat> Another equation that you might be familiar with, twice the acceleration times a final, a final position minus an initial position is equal to this, the difference of the squares of the final and initial velocities. This is just true. And the way you get this is you plug in tf, you plug in ti, and then you just subtract x of tf minus, or you, you just evaluate x of tf minus x of ti. You do some rearranging, and you would end up with this expression. So I'm not going to derive all of these for you. What I <clears throat> what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you these two kinematic equations, and then you guys can use those to drive whatever extra equations you might want or need. Um, 
that's really that's the powerful way to do this and it's it's significantly stronger to do it that way than it is to just memorize a list of equations now the way that we did that by the way is we <clears throat> or another thing that we could do is we could for example eliminate the time variable from these two equations that we have two equations two variables so you can eliminate time variable um, <clears throat> for example the average velocity which we talked about just a minute ago is just the sum of the initial and final velocities divided by two that happens to be true. Now, again, like I said, you're gonna need a lot of practice with these equations of motions. They show up literally everywhere. We'll be doing them for the rest of the quarter and you'll be doing them in 9b and 9c as well. So I gave you a list of, um, in, the, in the lecture notes, there's a list of six examples that I highly, highly, highly suggest that you go take a look at because it's, you know, you're gonna need to get practice and I don't really have the time to go over a hundred examples in lecture. So go look at those as practice. They're going to be in your there's going to be them in the homework too there's you're going to, you're going to see them in discussion and in lab all of these things you need to make these kinematic equations and using these and finding new equations like this that that needs to be bread and butter i mean I, I don't expect that of you right now but you'll have to work to get there so go do practice physics is best learned by practicing not just by memorizing right so once we have kinematic equations we can actually talk about free fall so free fall <clears throat> well, before I actually talk about free fall, um, actually, no, let, let's talk about it. So free fall is just, <clears throat> well, let me rephrase this. So free fall on the surface of a planet or surface of anything really is constant acceleration, constant acceleration motion or it's motion that has constant acceleration and that constant acceleration is downward in a straight line. So just think about like dropping an object on earth. It experiences constant acceleration and it, the acceleration points downwards. This is, again, this is, this is, this is still one dimensional because if you imagine a thing can only move up and down, free fall is when it move is when the acceleration points downwards. Do note that free fall does not necessarily mean it's it's moving downwards. A thing can be in free fall while moving up. So long as the acceleration points downwards, it's in free fall. Now I want to show you something that shows that this happens. It's a nice clip from, oh, you know, 60 years ago. Right. So this was filmed um, in the 1960s, I think. Maybe the maybe this maybe the early 70s. This is from the moon landing. So I'm going to just play this video. Hopefully you guys can hear it. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Gal To be clear, they're on the moon when they're filming this, just so we know. A Leo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings and on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Well, I think that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So, the reason why the reason why I showed you this example of them doing it on the moon is because it turns out if you were to drop a falcon feather and a hammer on Earth, they it wouldn't look like they accelerated at the same rate. And so <clears throat> this notion of free fall is kind of special because it implies that things move that 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 everything under the influence of gravity falls at the same rate. And the reason they did that on the moon was because there's no air on the moon, whereas on Earth there is air and that causes the, that, that changes the acceleration. That makes it different. And that's why the feather falls slower because there's drag. Now we'll talk about that in more detail later, but I just wanted to introduce this notion. Um, the, so, so these kinematic equations are only true when acceleration is constant. It's not that they ignore air resistance. They're just only valid when acceleration is constant. If the acceleration is not constant, they're not valid. In the case of drag, they're, there can be cases where drag still has constant, where there's still constant acceleration due to, uh, with drag involved. These kinematic equations are just general equations that only hold when acceleration is constant, period. Now, on Earth, so the reason it's, the reason on the moon it was so easy to see is because the moon has weak gravitational pull. By the way, I know we're done, we'll finish up in a minute. <clears throat> 
And so it was easy to see that they fall relatively slowly. On Earth, things fall faster, but the acceleration is still, it's still just a fixed number and it points downwards. So the acceleration due to gravity is typically called G. It's called the letter G. Usually that just denotes the um, G denote is just, it, it's, it's a scalar. It's not actually a vector. And, but we will use G when we're right in formulas for vectors elsewhere. Again, when we get to it, you'll see how it makes sense. Um, and that magnitude or the, the value of that scalar is about 10 meters per second squared. Remember acceleration is distance divide, or it's, it's, it, it's distance divided by time squared. It's the time derivative or two time derivatives of position. So it would have units of meters per second squared. <clears throat> And that acceleration is, of course, downwards. In fact, the way we define downwards is the direction that this uh, acceleration vector points, right? That's what it means for something to be pointing downward. Um, and so sometimes you might see me write this. You might see me write a vector g. So that would mean a vector with magnitude equal to this, this g here and points downwards. So the magnitude of this vector would be 10 meters per second squared. And just to put a pin on the, uh, or just to put a, not to put a too fine a point on the, uh, on this point, please do not use 9.8 meters per second. Please do not use 9.81 meters per second, whatever. What is happening in the background? <coughs> Just use 10. <coughs> so if you're talking about uh, if you're talking about a scalar, g, it's always 10. It's negative, it's never negative because magnitudes are always positive. <coughs> if you were talking about an acceleration that is upwards you would have to specify whether positive means upwards or positive means downwards. It depends on what your choice of convention is, but you have to choose. Typically we choose upwards means positive. So you, so if you said, if you're working in one dimension, you would use 10 meters per second squared, that would represent a, an upward vector and negative 10 meters per second squared would represent a, a downward vector using that convention. The reason why I'm not having you use 9.8 or 9.81 is because it makes your life harder. It makes the graders' lives harder. It makes my life harder. And it doesn't teach you anything more about the math or the physics. It's literally not helpful at all. It's, it's only off by 2%. And the estimations and approximations that we're going to make in this class are going to be off by a lot more than 2%. So just use 10. If I see you use 9.8, I will berate you and make fun of you. And I will make sure that you never use it again. So just please use 10. And if at some later point in college or in your job, <clears throat> you somebody gets mad at you for using 10, blame me, okay? And you can tell them that, look, if you're just doing kinematics, it doesn't matter. Also, another interesting fact, if you really wanna be more accurate and you wanna throw off a grader, use pi, or sorry, you pi, use pi squared. Pi squared is about G. So yeah, use that, that's funnier way funnier than 9.8 or 9.81. And it's about, it's just about as accurate. So use that if you really want to, if you really want to get clever, but please don't use 9.8 or 9.81 or whatever. Anyway, so that's the end of lecture today. Um, I will stick around. Um, <clears throat>